Hi, thank you for joining me. I want to talk uh, here about Rawls's idea of public reason, which forms a staple part of his revised theory of justice in political liberalism, and it's perhaps also the most controversial idea that he developed in that book. It has had numerous critics, and basically he seems to have upset a lot of people uh, while at the same time gaining adherence uh, from a variety of perhaps unexpected quarters by developing uh, the idea of public reason. Okay, so without further ado, uh, Rawls thinks that in order for his political conception of justice to be stable, this is a very, very important consideration for Rawls, he thinks that stability is essential to the uh, development and continuation of a just society over time and over generations. In order for stability to be achieved, it is uh, imperative that the citizens have things in common. And because you know, we live in a very pluralistic world these days, and because Rawls is envisioning a pluralistic, idealized scenario in political liberalism, Rawls is careful to point out that the adherents of his theory of justice, he stresses, need to uh, hold not just values in common, but also method in common in the way that they approach uh, political topics in the public sphere. And part and parcel of that is that he thinks that they need to all employ similar speech patterns because language is so important, it can be uniting, it can be dividing, it can have different characteristics. And these speech patterns, Rawls calls, the, that is the speech of political liberalism, Rawls calls the idea of public reason, public reason. And the, the key concept here is just that whenever citizens participate in uh, governance, uh, they need to do so ideally in accordance with the canons of public reason. And there seem to be some different levels of expectation here. So certainly a Supreme Court justice, Rawls would say, should always abide by public reason. A citizen, a private citizen, when engaged with others, uh, in argumentation about political matters, maybe has a little bit less of a, a necessity, a little bit less of a moral obligation to abide by public reason, but nevertheless ought to do so anyway. Well, what are the characteristics of public reason? Uh, public reason means that you advance your political argumentation, according to Rawls, in a manner that others can understand, can accept, and ultimately in a manner that will unite them. And that means you must strip your political arguments of all parochial characteristics. You must strip them of all characteristics that are unique to or specific to your particular worldview, your particular reasonable comprehensive doctrine. And instead, you must advance generic argumentation that anybody can accept, that is, uh, that is argumentation that someone from a different worldview, from a different perspective on the other side of the citizen body in a, a modern liberal democracy could nevertheless see the value of and understand from his own perspective and ultimately perhaps endorse. Okay, so one more time, the idea of public reason is just that you need to advance all political argumentation in a kind of a generic speech pattern that is generically secular and that does not uh, appeal to any uh, any religious uh, or ethnic or socioeconomic particularities that would make what you say um, unintelligible or difficult to comprehend, difficult to endorse for a fellow citizen. And what Rawls seems especially to have in mind here is uh, religious parochial uh, assumptions. He wants to strip those out of the political speech of the citizens of liberal democracies. Now, um, we can clearly see why Rawls would be motivated to do this. He wants to advance the idea of public reason so as to bring about unity and stability in the ideal society that he envisions. But at the same time, uh, he has been roundly criticized 
for these kinds of uh, arguments. So for instance, I'm a Christian, and as a Christian philosopher, I think that I am obligated to help the poor. That means my fellow citizens who are impoverished too. And a key reason, perhaps the key reason, why I think I'm obligated to help the poor is that the Christian scriptures tell me repeatedly in a number of different places that God cares for poor people and that God wants his people, that is, uh, the followers of God, to care for the poor as well because uh, that is where his heart is and that's what he cares for. Now, if I were to go into the public sphere and if I were to say, uh, it is important that we pass policies that help poor people because, as the scriptures say, uh, care for those who are poor among you, you know, uh, help the downtrodden, elevate those who are, um, who have been uh, beaten, uh, beaten down by life. And if I were to make an argument like that, Rawls would say what I was doing was out of bounds in a just society because I am appealing to a parochial set of assumptions, namely theistic background uh, information, in order to make my argument and to try to persuade my fellow citizens. Much better would be an argument along the following lines. It is important to help poor people because a society in which uh, the poor have, proportionally speaking, a much greater amount of the resources tends to be a society that isn't as uh, unstable or um, or hard to manage as a society that uh, has very stratified wealth patterns where the wealthy have a lot and the poor have very little. So it's best to have a society where everybody's uh, as equal as possible. The latter argument is a generic secular argument that Rawls thinks would be acceptable and justifiable on grounds of public reason. Now the criticisms that people have raised against Rawls basically amount to a couple of key points. And one of them is that uh, Rawls is, as I've mentioned before elsewhere, uh, smuggling in a worldview. And that worldview is a generically secular worldview under the guise of preventing uh, disunity or disharmony in a liberal democracy, he is in fact trying to force all of the citizens to conform to speech patterns which are secular in nature, have secular uh, background assumptions, and this is a worldview. And so he's not, on this way of seeing things, able to actually separate his own set of background assumptions from the idea of public reason that he advances uh, and in the end, he ultimately uh, tries to pull one over on all of us, as it were. Okay, and um, part and parcel of this is what might be called the Martin Luther King Jr. criticism. So Martin Luther King Jr. in his famous I Have a Dream speech references uh, biblical texts numerous times. Okay. Uh, he talks about the River Jordan. He talks about uh, Mount, holy mountains, going up on holy mountains, and uh, being there with all the brothers and sisters who were all together in unity. And he uses countless references to biblical texts. And this kind of poetic reference is something that has struck many Americans as being very powerful, whether they are Christians or not. And on this second criticism, this Martin Luther King Jr. criticism, what Rawls is doing is actually uh, dumbing down uh, our ability to understand each other. Okay, often it's possible for us not just to understand, but to appreciate the argumentation that others who have different worldview assumptions are making, even when they are speaking parochially in the context of their worldviews using assumptions that are part and parcel of their worldviews explicitly and uh, arguing or, or, or rhetorically challenging us in that way. And Rawls in saying that we need to strip all our speech of these things uh, is arguably on the second criticism treating us like children. He's essentially saying that we can't uh, handle other citizens who think differently than we do and as such, we need to uh, be spoon-fed uh, generic secular reasons that we can handle and that are intelligible to us. Okay, and 
this second criticism is joined at the hip with the criticism that uh, what Rawls really wants is a secular society, and so he uh, tries to, uh, in a kind of a roundabout way, uh, he tries to angle out the religious foundations of the society, or, or to try to um, to try to push those foundations to the margins as much as possible. Okay, so here we have three criticisms of Rawls's idea of public reason. Uh, one is that uh, the idea of public reason is uh, an effort on Rawls's part to smuggle in a worldview. The other is that Rawls is treating the citizens of liberal democracies like children, and he's not appreciating their ability to understand and argue with each other in the fullness of each of their worldviews. And the third criticism is that Rawls is uh, actually himself trying to advance a secular foundation for society that will intentionally uh, limit or reduce religion to marginal places in the society. I will elsewhere talk a little bit more about some of these ideas, but that's all I've got for now.